because it's a tough slog at the start of setting up a social media page. It gets easier as it gets bigger. Um, but that first year that we spent setting things up was a, a really tough slog. The main thing that I've, I've realized is don't cater for yourself. Um, so um, the Instagram stuff, I catered for myself. I went, well, I'd be on Instagram, so I'm going to cater for me. Um, and um, I realized that that was wrong. Um, I've gone to sleep and I've woken up the next day and we've made £1,500 in bookings or £2,000 in bookings over six or seven uh, bookings because we have that system in place whereby if you are that other model that is a lot more hands-on, it's impossible for that to happen. Hello and welcome to the Glampy Tech Podcast. Today I'm joined for our 10th episode by Callum McLeod, co-founder of Glampy Tech and the first person to appear as a guest twice on this show. In his first appearance, we introduced Glampatect as a company and touched upon some glamping industry trends. But today we're going to dive a lot deeper into a specific topic, and that's marketing your glamping site before the site is open. Before Callum founded Glampatect, he set up a glamping business called North Coast 500 Pods, or NC 500 Pods. And in his first site in Brora, he achieved a 75% occupancy rate in the first month as a result of all the social media marketing work he did, which started before he'd even applied for planning permission. If you're in the process of setting up a glamping site or you're thinking of doing so soon, this one is worth a listen. Social media marketing is so important in 2021 and getting it right early on can really help you hit the ground running. Just before we start, I'd like to say a thank you to all of our listeners. We recently passed a thousand downloads of the podcast, which is something we're really happy with at Glampitect. If I could ask you one more favour, it would be for you to pass the podcast on to anyone who might find it useful. As ever, I hope you enjoy and find value in today's episode. Hello again, Callum. This is episode 10. Uh, you were obviously our first guest in episode one. Uh, we've come a long way since then. We've recently just found out that we've hit a thousand downloads, which is amazing. Um, what's, what have you been doing since we first recorded? Because a lot has happened at Glampitect. Hi, Nick. Yeah, um, well done on 10 podcasts already. That's crazy. It seems like it was only a couple of weeks ago that we were doing the first one. Um, so yeah, well done. You've obviously been busy. I'm just about as busy as me. It's been uh, crazy at uh, Glam Protect, the Dubai launch, uh, the UAE launch that I think we spoke about um, in the first one, we maybe said it's a bit of an idea, is now a fully fledged thing that is, um, we, we've fully launched, uh, we've got guides out, we've got landing pages, lots of information on the website, um, we've been in the news a lot actually today um, about it, there's loads of different articles on, on various different channels um, about it, uh, we've also uh, grown our team probably by uh, four or five people since our last conversation. Um, and we have more jobs out at the moment for um, people right throughout the business. So yeah, just growth, crazy amounts of growth, um, crazy amounts of being able to help people start up glamping sites. Um, it's yeah, everything's just going great just now. You know, we're, we're primed to be able to help people that are looking to set up glamping sites. Um, and there's lots of people wanting to do it, obviously, because of the Current climate, um, the the way things are with holidays, uh, there really has never been a better time to start a glamping business. And the innov- innovators out there that own land or are looking at land, looking to set up glamping sites, are you know biting at us at the moment. They're they're all desperate to get things going. Okay, and so obviously the future of glamping tech is exciting, but we're going to go a bit further back today. We're going to discuss um, marketing your glamping site, but specifically before you actually launch your site, um, because that's something that you did with NC500 Pods to to great success, really. Uh, You did, you you know, you you were constantly on marketing NC500 on social media long before, long before you actually set the site up. Um, And that's something that we recommend all of our clients do. So could you just, um, just, just tell us basically what gave you the idea to start the the marketing campaign long before you launched and actually how, how far in advance you did start the marketing? Okay, yeah. So what gave me the idea? I don't really know. It wasn't like um, we had an amazing resource like what Glampatech now is for the people looking to set up glamping businesses. Um, we didn't have that back then. And at the time, I wasn't really that business aware, I don't think. Um, it was more of a subconscious thing, I think. You know, I think I've always had quite a lot of business mind um, subconsciously um, that's now obviously come to the forefront. And I think you know there was a little thing ticking in the back of my head 
saying, you know, you should do this. Um, and so, yeah, we launched um, our social media crazy, crazy early. Uh, we launched the social media before we'd even started a planning application. Um, and to be clear, I would never necessarily recommend that people do that. Um, we did do it. <laughs> I don't want to say backwards because long term it's massively benefited us. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to say to everybody, you know, go and employ um, or go and spend your time, uh, your own time setting up a social media page, um, spending all the time uh, or employ a marketing agency or employ Glampotech to do your social media marketing, spend all of this money or all of this time. And then you put in planning and it gets refused. So I don't want people to run away and do that thinking that what we've done um, is going to work every time. Um, but if people want to do it, knowing that there is a risk that you could spend that time and um, get planning refused uh, and, and you've kind of wasted a bit of time, then, you know, absolutely go for it. Now, what I would say um, is that it has massively benefited us in the long run, as, as, as I've said, um, but it's a bit of a risk at the same time. Um, so long term, uh, we now have 35,000 people on Facebook, 25,000 people on Instagram for North Coast 500 pods. And I can say for certain that we wouldn't be anywhere near that if we didn't have that year uh, in advance that we um, set the groundworks, you know, prepared the foundations. Um, because it's a tough slog at the start of setting up a social media page. It gets easier as it gets bigger. Um, but that first year that we spent setting things up was a, a really tough slog. Um, and, you know, if you want to do that in advance of getting planning or, you know, as soon as you get planning approval um, to give yourself the best opportunity to have a good social media by the time you're open, it absolutely makes sense. So um, what sort of content were you posting? Because obviously if you're posting a year in advance of you start actually being set up, it must be difficult to come up with ideas. Yeah, of course. Um, so that is a good question. Um, it's difficult to come out up with ideas. I wouldn't say massively. Um, you know, once you start to think slightly outside the box, there's plenty of stuff that you can do. Um, local area, there's unlimited local area. You could post something new every day about your local area and never run out of stuff. Um, you can put up the pods themselves. Um, you know, if you've decided on the manufacturer, you can get photos uh, from the manufacturer, post them. Um, and finally, and I would say most importantly, and this is something that people don't necessarily think uh, is good, but actually we strongly recommend it, is um, build progress and you know, here's the land that the glamping site is going to go on, because crucially that will be bringing people along on the journey with you. And people coming on the journey with you means more bookings right from day one. We had 75% um, occupancy in our first month of opening purely because of social media, because of the following that we gained. Um, I would say people became fans of our business because they came on the journey with us through social media. So it's very emotive. You can make it very, you know, people get involved. Um, you can say, oh, guys, um, we're thinking about buying sofas. Do you, want, do you think we should have this one or this one? What kettles should we have? People get involved. They feel um, like they're part of the journey. And if they pick the kettle and they pick the sofa and whatever else, and then they see that you've actually selected that kettle and that sofa, they want to go along so that they can say, oh, look, they picked the sofa that we, we said they should go for. Um, and it brings people along on that journey with you, which is invaluable long term. And I know NC500 Pods does really well on Facebook now, but am I right in thinking that you're initially heavily focused on Instagram with your marketing? Yeah, absolutely. So we, um, well, I, at the time, spent the vast majority of my time on Instagram. Uh, I am Instagram generation, and I um, believed at the time that Instagram was going to be, um, you know, by far the best way to market. And I spent probably 80% of my time on Instagram, and the remaining 20 I spent on Facebook. And I would basically just be copying the posts that I put on Instagram onto Facebook. Uh, and as time went by, we were getting a disproportionately high amount of um, stuff going on on Facebook versus Instagram. So um, as I say, I was putting up 80% or I was putting 80% of my time to Instagram and 20% of my time to Facebook. And we were probably getting, you know, 50-50 in terms of people talking, people commenting, liking, 
uh, going to the website and all these sorts of things and ultimately booking. Um, and, you know, it made me question, is Instagram the right thing to be working on? Um, or more so, should I be focusing more time on Facebook? And so I went to 50-50 and um, the uh, Facebook stuff proportionally grew. Um, so suddenly Facebook was now well ahead of Instagram for interactions, comments, likes, um, people going to the website and people booking when they were getting the same amount of time put into each of them. Um, so from there, I switched to a much more Facebook focused model um, and just kind of posted everything that was designed for Facebook onto Instagram. And it's, it's really pushed us on from there. Um, there's a lot more people wanting to book on Facebook than on Instagram. People are happy to give you a like on Instagram, um, but not necessarily um, to book. So uh, if you were to choose between the two, um, I would 100% say Facebook um, you do. Uh, although I would recommend you, that you do at least do a bit of Instagram, um, but focus around Facebook generally. Um, the, the best model would be to focus around Facebook, but then also post the same sort of stuff on Instagram. Nice. And um, obviously you learned during that process that Facebook can actually be really powerful, particularly when it comes to converting uh, engagement into into cash for, for when people are booking. Is there anything else that you learned in that process about maybe marketing or in general or about glam, the, the, the kind of glamping audience or anything like that? Um, so people love to get involved. It's kind of a similar tone to what I was saying um, about making things emotive, um, but people really like to get involved in the process um, and see what's going on, understand what's going on. Um, so that, that was something that surprised me, I would say. I didn't expect that. Um, and actually, here's a really key learning that, that I've taken from this, um, from that stage. Um, to exactly answer your question, the main thing that I've, I've realized is don't cater for yourself. Um, so um, the Instagram stuff, I catered for myself. I went, well, I'd be on Instagram, so I'm going to cater for me. Um, and... Um, I realized that that was wrong. I realized that more stuff goes on in Facebook. Um, there's a bigger demographic there. So that, that was a bit of a stumbling block for me. And I realized that not just with that, um, but with things like the emotive joining in the journey, again, I wouldn't do that. So I didn't bother doing that at the start uh, because I thought, well, I wouldn't be interested. So why would anyone else? Um, but people are. Um, so what I would say is not to confuse things. I always say try and cater for yourself when you're setting up your glamping site because you're going to be able to sell it the best if it matches your expectations. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to marketing, um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you would do that. Um, I would say that you need to think of what the broader audience is going to be um, interested in, what they're going to be doing. And our broader audience is on Facebook and that's why we pivoted to that and our broader audience wants to join in the emotive journey of setting up the glamping site, and we've pivoted to now um, catering for that as well. Um, so to distill all that down to a, a sentence or two, um, don't think that the way that you think is how everyone else does. Um, you know, Get an understanding of what the majority of the market's like and cater for them. Okay, and you said there that your, your audience wanted to get involved with the journey and things like that. Was there a particular demographic that you were aiming at? Presumably it, it, it's in parallel with the demographic that you want, to, that you're aiming for to stay at your site. Yeah, absolutely. So it's generally women from age 25 or 30 up to 45 or 50. Um, they, they like getting involved in Facebook and, and you know, showing their friends, oh, look, we said this and, and it happened and showing their partner and all those sorts of things. Um, you know, the older men aren't going to do it. Younger men aren't going to do it. Um, it it's typically the demographic that would get most involved is women of around that age. And that ties in quite well to our bookings, exactly as you say. It typically is women of around that age um, booking or men of around that age whose partners of around that age have said, oh, look, they've got the kettle that we said, um, <laughs> we need to go and book there, and then the partner books. Um, so, yeah, it all ties in, um, basically. Okay, and was there any particular post that led to a, a big 
leap in in following or was it quite gradual? Yeah, so this is something that probably everyone's seen is competitions. Um, you know, like and share this post, tag your friends that you would take and win a free stay. Um, they always bump us up, um, you know, by potentially thousands of likes at a time. Um, so it's one that it does mess a little bit with the Facebook algorithm. So I wouldn't suggest that you do it all the time, um, but it can give you a very good boost in um, traction, likes, people um, seeing you and all those sorts of things. Okay. And obviously, as you build up more of a following, you get more and more engagement, but engagement is one thing and income is another. Um, how yeah. did you ensure that and still continue to ensure that the engagement you get and the followers you have, they convert into bookings? Yeah, absolutely. So this is crucial um, to people and they sometimes don't realize it. A lot of glamping sites will you know, be busy on, on Facebook, busy on Instagram, and they don't have the back end to back it up. Um, so you, we would strongly recommend that you have a, a good website and channel manager system through the back so that when somebody sees one of your Facebook posts go, oh, they look great, come onto your Facebook page and then go, right, what now? Uh, we've seen that even at that point, um, some of these Facebook um, pages for glamping sites don't even have a link to a website. And then you've done all the hard work, you've, you've done the stuff that you need to do on Facebook, and then somebody's come to actually look at you and there's not even a link. So first things, make sure you get a link uh, to your website. And then from there, make sure your website's strong enough that a potential buyer can flow through it um, nice and cleanly to a point whereby they're ready to book. Um, and then from there, actually book on the website as well. So um, getting a good channel manager system that makes things nice and clear is, again, strongly recommended. And that means that you can literally make money whilst you sleep. Uh, you know, we see a lot of people uh, glamping sites that say, DM us on Facebook to book. And then that's completely manual. And now that works for some people. Um, I, I often speak about the two different types of glamping site owner, the completely hands-on one that's maybe retired and wants to get involved day to day. Um, and the person like me that wants to be as hands-off as possible. And they're two completely different people. And, you know, for the guys that I mentioned first, the Facebook DMs and stuff potentially suits them. But for somebody that wants to have a, a stronger business with less time input daily, um, you want to make sure that they've got the strong website through the back um, and, and put in the least amount of time possible. And for that, a good channel manager system is an absolute must. Um, you know, I've got some examples of when we've, um, I've gone to sleep and I've woken up the next day and we've made £1,500 in bookings or £2,000 in bookings over six or seven uh, bookings because we have that system in place whereby if you are that other model that is a lot more hands-on, it's impossible for that to happen. Yeah, and, and so obviously a channel manager system brings together all the booking systems that you've got. Um, obviously, the main one that you want to book through is your website, but uh, NC500 Pod's also listed on Airbnb and Expedia, um, and we, we suggest to our clients that that's something that they should consider as well. Uh, were you listed on those external sites um, in, in the build-up to, to your site launching? Yeah, absolutely. So here's another key thing about setting up uh, in advance of being open. Uh, this is general. This isn't just Airbnb and Expedia. Um, in general, pretty much the day that you know for certain that you're going to be able to open by a certain date, um, I would recommend that from that point, you get yourself live on everything. Your own website, say on social media, come and book us, um, you know, booking.com, Airbnb, all these places. Um, make sure, though, this is absolutely crucial. Make sure that you can 100% make that date. Because if you start having people pay you money and then you don't have a water supply, that turns into a complete disaster. Um, so make sure that you're completely in control of the things that still need to be done um, before you open. Um, but as long as you've got that covered, um, yeah, get live on your own website, booking.com, Airbnb, and all these things. Um, one thing, a slight tangent, but still along the same lines, uh, is that we've got some a lot of data on the different channels and we would change our approach um, based off of the information that we now have. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to get something right for Expedia, Airbnb, as you said, um, and TripAdvisor rentals as well. And what we've actually seen is that we get barely any bookings from any of them. Uh, Booking.com is by far the industry leader uh, in terms of actually getting your bookings. 
Um, and beyond that, our own website gets us the vast majority of our bookings. So because of our good marketing, because we set things up in advance, all these sorts of things, um, we uh, get 80% plus of our bookings through our own website. We then get probably about 15 to 18% of our bookings come from booking.com. And then the Airbnb, TripAdvisor and Expedia literally fight for the scraps. So um, what I would say is that you 100% want to focus on your own website and on um, getting all that right in the channel manager system to put the uh, booking platform in place on your own website and then also focus on booking.com. But I would say that beyond that, it's not as much of an important thing to get on the rest. And you want to be directing the majority of your traffic through the website anyway as well, because, um, you know, booking.com will charge you, is it, would they charge a commission on, on your bookings? And obviously Absolutely. That so booking.com are 15%. They take 15% off of you. Expedia are like 10 or 15%. Airbnb are a bit cheaper and charge the front end as well. Um, and I can't even remember what TripAdvisor is, which tells you how few bookings we get from them. Um, but what I would say is that if you have a good channel manager system, you can add percentages onto your costs nightly for various different channels. So for example, with our own sites, all we do is say to um, booking.com, here's the price, but it's plus 20% on top of what our standard price is on our website, um, which means that actually we don't pay the commissions, meaning that it doesn't matter if we get a booking from booking.com or um, our own website. And as well as that, it means that people that come through our own website get rewarded versus the ones that go to booking.com because they get um, a cheaper rate, which is a win-win um, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and in the, the whole process of marketing your site, your uh, glamping site before it launched, is there anything that you wish you'd have done differently? So not really. Um, and that's always a question I get asked and it frustrates me when I don't have answers to that because um, I know that that's what people are really interested in. Um, but just get busy. That, that's one thing that probably a lot of people would get wrong. Um, we didn't, we got very busy right from the start. Um, so it's not something that we got wrong, but it's something that I would say um, a lot of the people at home listening potentially would get wrong. Um, get busy on social media, get busy on your marketing, prioritize your marketing because ultimately that's going to be what fills your glamping site once it's set up. Uh, a lot of people at home probably think, oh, you know, build and they will come. And that's wrong. Um, or it's not necessarily wrong, but it's not going to give you the best opportunity at success. Certainly, um, certainly not when you're just launching as well. We obviously word of mouth marketing absolutely. plays a part eventually, but we're talking about getting on the first night that your site opens, you want to be as full as possible. And marketing is obviously huge for that. 100%. So we could scale back on our marketing now and probably do okay. Um, because exactly as you see, the word of mouth comes with time. Um, but uh, as I said, we were 75% full in month one. Uh, we were like 98% full in month two and 100% month three and four. That's impossible without shouting about yourselves on social media uh, and beyond. And it's, you know, it, it's not, you're not expected to be putting out, um, you know, award-winning photography either. It's, you know, it's just something that, something that gets across your, your your brand and can get your audience involved, I imagine, as well. It doesn't have to be perfect every time, every post. So here's the thing about marketing that a lot of people get wrong as well. Uh, in my my opinion, you know, there's plenty of opinions out there, uh, but in my opinion, I believe that a lot of people um, get this wrong. Uh, they try and make things perfect. They try and get the best photo in the world. They try and get the best text in the world. Um, and what I would say is that, you know, in fact, there's a great um, book title uh, that I love. It says, start now, get perfect later. And I think that that's an amazing principle, not just for marketing, but for life. Um, but in this, when we're dialing into marketing uh, in particular, you know, start doing things, put things up, see what works, see what doesn't. Because if you put up a post that nobody's interested in, exactly that, nobody's interested in it. You're not going to do yourself any damage. All that you're going to do is nobody's going to like it. And so what? Move on. Unless you put out something yeah. horrible. Yeah. I mean, don't start abusing people or fighting people. Don't do, don't do anything like crazy. But, you know, something that you think is not going to annoy anyone, uh, post it up. And if it, if it doesn't do anything, so what? 
propose something better tomorrow and just try everything. You know, put up a post about the local area, put up a post about the pods, put up a post about the bill, the kettles and beyond. You know, say, oh, here's a glamping site that we'd love to look like. Um, we're planning on doing that. All these things you can post about and then see the ones that are good, the ones that are bad and the ones that are ugly. Never do the ugly ones again. See if the ones that are, are bad can be improved and, um, you know, do more of the good ones. And um, you'll learn with time what works, what doesn't, and do more of what works and less of what doesn't. Yeah. And obviously we spoke to Maury, I think it was episode five, um, at the Gun Protects in-house marketing guy. And um, although obviously it is important, you know, to, to just get content out there and, and experiment and stuff, but he also did mention the importance of, having a bit of consistency when it comes to your brand and um, the sort of the, the graphics that you put out. So I would add in there, well, it is important to get, get stuff out there. You also must remember the, the brand image that you're trying to create, whether that's the colors or the personality, it should, you should aim and be consistent. Eventually once, once you get into the groove, you should certainly aim for a bit of consistency as well. Yeah. I think a key point there that you said is once you get into the groove, um, I would say that if it's a case of making sure everything's uniform and great or not posting at all, um, you absolutely want to be um, avoiding that and posting um, rather than um, getting everything uniform. Uh, but I would say that with time, you know, get everything out there um, to begin with. And as you grow and as you get a following and as you open, then start to focus a lot more on getting things um you know, a lot more in line with it, the business as a whole. Brand colors, brand guidelines, as you say, because I completely agree that once you're open, um, that's important. Um, but until that stage, um, I would say the priority is just on getting things out. Okay, and obviously at Glam Protect, we do offer marketing services. So can I just give us a, let's say, let's cap it at 30 seconds because we don't want to pitch too much. Um, what sort of services do you offer for websites and marketing? No problem at all. So we have an in-house marketing team that can deal with just about anything um, marketing-wise. Um, one of the hires that I mentioned at the start of the podcast that we're taking on um, is a marketing lead that's going to you know, revolutionize the team even further. Um, but the main things that I would say um, that we would recommend for glamping site owners is one of the first things is brand guidelines, as you've said, um, to make sure that your marketing is consistent once you open. And then beyond that, we can help with setting up social media, um, with consistent posting on social media, dealing with um, any questions that people post on Facebook or Instagram uh, and beyond. Um, I wouldn't necess necessarily recommend that you have anything like Google Ads or anything like that, um, unless you're a little bit bigger, maybe 10 plus units. Um, but for anything that's less than 10 units, uh, we can absolutely help with all social media needs, uh, all posting, all content, um, to make sure that you have lots of bookings from when you open or if you only um, work with us after you've opened um, from beyond that stage. Okay, I think that stretched the definition of 30 seconds, but it would do. Um, who, who can they contact if they want to um, hear more about the marketing services that we offer? Yep, so the best thing to do would be to just email into contact at glamprotect.co.uk and you'll be put in touch with the right person. Uh, alternatively, phone us. Uh, on the new phone number, which I actually don't know what it is, but if you Google Glam Protect phone number, uh, be, you'll be able to find it. It'll be in the description to this episode as well. Perfect. Okay, so, well, thanks for, it, for your time again, Callum. Really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you for continuing to do a good job in the podcast. Cheers. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Glam Protect podcast. I hope you enjoyed and that you found value in today's episode. If you did, feel free to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts as it really helps us move up the podcast rankings. Thank you.